Good afternoon, everybody, and you're very welcome to this web webinar on the care of older adults with intellectual disabilities and complex age-related conditions. My name is Rosalind Tamming. I'm the Head of Policy, Research and Public Affairs at the National Disability Authority. We commissioned this Trinity Centre for Ageing and Disability to carry out this work back in 2020, but it was one of the many research projects that were delayed due to COVID-19 pandemic. However, we're delighted today to be able to publish this report. Before I hand over to Fintan, who's going to present, uh, I just want to point out a few Zoom features. If you require, require captioning, you can turn this on at the bottom of your screen using the CC button. The Irish Sign Language Interpreter is pinned to the screen, so you should be able to view that without difficulty. The chat function has been disabled, but we would invite you to include your questions in the Q&A box, uh, and we'll get to as many as we can during the, the panel discussion and question and answer session. The webinar is being recorded, so we will email you with a link afterwards um, in, a, in a couple of days so that you can share with any colleagues or you can look back at it. Uh, so I'm very pleased now to introduce Dr. Uh, Fintan Sheeran, Associate Professor in Intellectual Di Disability Nursing from Trinity College, Dublin, who was the primary investigator on this project. So over to you, Fintan. Thank, thank you, Rosan. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. And I'm going to present some of the key findings and some background information uh, related to this study. Um, and I think you, you'll find that these um, the, 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 the issues that have Risen through the uh, through the findings are really quite important and for, uh, offer some really important insights, I suppose, into the um, what we need in terms of uh, intellectual disability service development into the future. So the project was the care of older adults with intellectual disability and complex age-related conditions, um, and uh, the, the research team, many of whom are here and whom who I will introduce uh, at the end of this presentation, uh, brought together. Um, uh, leaders in intellectual disability research from intellectual uh, from from uh, Trinity College Dublin, specific, specifically from the Trinity Centre for Aging and Intellectual Disability, um, because of the the fact that the the the, the project expa uh, spanned a longer period of time than was expected due to COVID. There have been some changes on the team during that period, and we acknowledge the work of uh, Dr. Amara Nasir and also Ms. Aideen Foden in in bringing this board uh, during their time on the project. The report will be available through the NDA website, but also through the Trinity Centre for Aging and Intellectual Disability website. So we launched this in January 2020, um, which looking back um, was a, uh, a uh, probably the wrong time to, to, to uh, launch into any research if we'd known what was coming at, at that point, because it led to quite significant COVID related delays. It's also made sampling and, and access very challenging. And whereas we had initially set out to uh, engage with intellectual disability services and nursing homes, the effect of COVID-19 on the nursing homes across Ireland made it literally impossible to, uh, to, to engage with them. And, and I recognize and acknowledge the challenges that they faced. I think there were significant challenges within intellectual disability services as well. And we heard about those during our, um, our meetings and our, our, our engagements with people across the services. We have ethical approval. Uh, uh, we received ethical approval from Trinity College Dublin, but we also got approvals from all of the services that we engaged with. So the aim of the study was to examine the care and service options for older adults with intellectual disabilities and complex age related conditions across a number of settings. Um, so the, 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 when we applied for the tender in this, there were three categories of settings which were identified, those that had specific aging pathways within the intellectual disability sector, and those within the sector that had, let's call them generic pathways, um, where people lived but, uh, through, through, the, through parts of their lives and into their older age, but maybe they were, they, 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 the service they received wasn't uh, specifically developed around, for example, palliative care, uh, de dementia care, etc. And then nursing homes were, were, were the others. We found that uh, separating and categorizing services in this way, um, whilst it may seem intuitively correct, we found that it's, it's actually very difficult to, 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 to um, uh, delineate different types of services. And yes, some services had aging 
uh, facility, uh, aged care facilities, but they also have many other types of service uh, provision for older people as well. So we'll, we'll see how that played out. Some definitions uh, as we start. Um, what is com a complex age-related condition? Well, I've highlighted some key words in, in these definitions. So it's a combination of physical, intellectual, health, behavioral, emotional, and welfare needs along a continuum of complexity. And that's an important concept that complexity is a, continue, a continuum and it doesn't stay still. And the dynamic nature of it, which is highlighted in the, in the complex care needs definition, means that uh, it often challenges the, the health structures and the social and educational structures that are needed to support people who have complex age-related conditions. And these uh, conditions uh, often bring with them uh, different types of patterns of healthcare utilization uh, and often attract a significant cost. So from the outset, a, dy a dynamic server is responsive service uh, and a service that has funding that can respond in a meaningful way to the individual's um, and needs uh, and, and desires is, is, for, is, is, is forefront. And that again is something which we saw coming up throughout the findings. Uh, for the purpose of this study, we uh, use the definition of an older person with intellectual disability as somebody aged 40 years and older. And that matches with the IDS tilde work, which uh, my, my colleagues, um, Professor Mary McCarran and Professor uh, Philip McCallion uh, are leading. We did a, we looked to the literature and I know this uh, this is quite probably quite difficult to see, but we looked to the literature to see what the main concepts out there were. But the first thing we found, because an initial ask of us in, the, in, in, this, in this project was to, uh, identify age-related models of care for people with intellectual disability, and we found that there were there were there were very there was very little in the literature about that, and there were no clear models out there. So we tried to bring the literature together and identify some of the key principles. So aging in place is something which uh, goes across all the age-related literature, intellectual disability-focused and, and mainstream-focused. The, the concept that people should be able to remain in the place where they're living and perceive the service that they, 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 they need in a person-centered support manner so, uh, so that they can age in that place. And, and if it's if possible, that they, they will achieve the end of life in that place as well. Some of the key principles to providing a model of care based on the literature suggested that for, for aging a place and person-centered support to happen, there needs to be good integration between disability services, generic health services, specialist services, and local health services, um, so community-based services. There needs to be uh, networking where everybody who needs to be involved uh, uh, is is involved in the decision making. <clears throat> that includes the, the 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 person obviously with intellectual disability themselves, the the caregivers, uh, the, uh, the 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 community, crucially the family, uh, and also the professionals who are who 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 uh, uh, are uh, need to be in place to support. The workforce needs to be configurable around the needs of the person, and so skills need to be available that match the needs. Um, there needs to be an interdisciplinary approach and everything needs to be person-centered and person-focused. And there also needs to be planning. And that planning is, is uh, looking forward. It's, it's not retro, it's not, it's, not, it's not dealing with things that ha happen as they happen. It's planning uh, in a prospective manner. And it needs to be, planning needs to be dynamic, responsive, and ensure that expertise is configured around the person. Uh, and centrally also is planning must include the voice of the person with intellectual disability. So that's what we saw from the literature and heading into our own work to add to that body of literature, we carried out um, a, a, a mixed method study, which had two phases. The first phase uh, incorporated us meeting with um, virtually with um, service managers in a number of services um, and finding out what they understood 
in terms of the model or approaches to service that, that would best uh, uh, fit the needs of people with intellectual disability. We followed that up with the survey of many services across the, um, uh, the country and 32 services responded in that, um, which gave us insights into the type of complexity that, the, that is being um, um, found as people age with intellectual disability. And we have to remember that aging with intellectual disability is a relatively recent phenomenon. So we're still learning new things as we are seeing new types of complexity developing. Um, it also gave us an insight into the, into the, the patterns of service to respond to those, those issues that arise for people. Uh, phase two involved focus groups with direct service providing staff, nurses, social care professionals, for example, uh, and also interviews with family and older people. Um, and we also followed up with a, a, co a cost analysis type survey, which uh, there were only two responses to that. And our, uh, we were just trying to get some insight into uh, the, 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 where, where the most costly elements are in providing service for people with intellectual disability. And that was led by the fact that so, so much of the discussion in the qualitative parts of this focused on resource uh, difficulties, getting resources, and um, the challenges for funding. So we had 79 engagements in all when we bring together the focus groups, the individual interviews, uh, and the, uh, the surveys. So it's a, a broad range of perspectives coming into this. The main findings uh, center around three themes. First of all, approaches to service. Um, and this is trying to address what in the literature we were seeing uh, a, a, a dearth of knowledge in, really, uh, in, in, in respect of it. Though in, in the literature, we couldn't find clear service approaches, clear models. We were trying to see what, what are people doing at the moment and what might be a, the best approach to, uh, uh, in, into the future. Uh, we, some, a lot of the, 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 the findings also focused around um, the, how service is provided to people with intellectual disability at the age and how, then how that service can respond to the individual person's needs. So I'm going to provide some, or present some findings under each of those. Uh, I suppose when we look at approaches to service, we immediately found that they're not, as I said, deline not delineated into specific types. And really, most services are providing uh, uh, an eclectic mix of approaches and settings. Um, and, and so some people with, will age with intellectual disability, perhaps uh, along a, a path which is geared towards healthy aging. Whereas other people in the same service mightn't be, uh, be able to uh, receive that service because uh, there's only a number of places available or a number of resources available. And that has to be uh, uh, provided uh, based on, uh, well, it can be based on particular need of, of people, but often those who need the service may not actually get the, uh, the age-related service. Um, and that, that is grounded to a large degree, as we'll see in a few moments, in the, the difficulties with getting funding that can respond to the person's needs and create the service that they need as they grow older. We saw a mix of a sort of nurse-led approaches, health and social care approaches, and also what we call specialist approaches, which were geared around um, 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 issues or challenges such as dementia uh, and, and the likes. Uh, the next slide, uh, don't worry about the numbers on, on the top of, of, of each of the bars, because what we're seeing is that across the settings, there were some, there were, there was a mix of individual homes and community. There were congregation settings in the same service. There were in, the, in services had people living at home with family members. Services had people living in nursing homes, uh, in specialist uh, dementia services, uh, in clustered homes in the community. Uh, and in some cases, uh, the response that services felt was, was, was a be a, well, best matched the need in the context of limited resources was creating uh, essentially nursing homes for people with intellectual disability within the services themselves. So each service showed a mix of, of, of a number of these particular types of settings. The principles underpinning service that came out in the findings uh, restated the importance of aging in place. And it's everybody 
uh, stated, whether it was in the survey or in the in the um, in the in the interviews and the focus groups, that aging in place was the gold standard which people sought to achieve, and they felt that in order to be able to support somebody to age in place, there needed to be a, a level of responsivity, which goes back to the dy dy dynamic nature of a, ser of, ser of a service approach, because complex aging uh, uh, complexity doesn't stay still. It's, as people age, complexity changes, and it's a dynamic process as well. There needs to be proactive future planning underpinning uh, an, a, a quality aging service. <clears throat> and that planning, brought in the voices of the person with intellectual disability, but it also brought in the family's voices as well. And so family involvement was crucial here. Links to generic and specialist services were highlighted. Um, and another one which was a key limiting factor to providing a, a healthy aging in place, <clears throat> excuse me, was the need for the physical environment to be modifiable. And, and many, uh, again, as we see, many people are, are, are living in rented accommodation, our services rent accommodation, which isn't modifiable because uh, uh, it's, it's not permitted by, by the landlord. Um, so that's something that needs to be considered and it's been raised in, in the report and the recommendations. And there needs to be skilled staff. And that means skills which match the needs and desires of the person. Some the challenges I've, uh, I've mentioned, some of them resource limitations posed a particular challenge to uh, being able to meet those gold standards. Uh, the difficulty that people reported in accessing mainstream health and social services is something which is, is, is worrying, uh, but we've heard of this before in other, in other studies. But this other area of perspectives and models, this, the, the, I suppose that, that discourse between medical model, social model, Etc., which we've been hearing about for a long time, uh, that still is playing out um, in 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 some settings where where some people uh, some people report is saying, well, if somebody becomes ill, uh, we don't want this to become a medical setting. So that may have a have a play a role in the person being moved to uh, a, a place where the health issues can be addressed um, more directly. Rather than bringing the bringing the the, the, the expertise and, and and skills into the uh, site, um, in terms of providing service to meet individuals' needs, um, changing demographics, we know people are 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 are, are living longer. Uh, emerging health needs are, are 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 being found. Things we have didn't know about before are continuing to emerge, and increasing complexity is there. Some of the key issues. Our health issues, which were identified, were, for example, dementia, mental health, behaviours, um, multimorbidity, and frailty. But when we look at whether these were be, being addressed through effective pathways, and so were there pathways, age-related pathways in place to support people, we find that in these these five key, well, four of these key areas. Um, um, are, are being managed to a, to a certain degree to effective our limited pathways. But um, frailty, and yes, multimorbidity as well, cancer, obesity, uh, uh, people have reported that uh, in many situations, there's no pathway to support the, these issues for people as they age. And even pain and chronic illness and, and sensory impairment, the pathways uh, uh, available are limited. So, uh, that that pathway uh, a, there's an issue in relation to the pathways and the uh, uh, um, uh, the availability of clear approaches to, to to meeting these needs. There's also issues in relation to accessibility to mainstream health services, and I mean it's you can see again when we move across accessible, fairly accessible, and non-accessible, we're finding that there are uh, things such as mental health, uh, um, um, psychology. Uh, occupational therapy, these, and even general practice are, are often not as easily accessed as we would like them to be. Um, and, and we've seen that in terms of the move from, from congregation settings to community, that sometimes they, 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 the health service are not, a, not as accessible as, as, as we would expect or want them to be. But there are some areas such as public health nursing, which um, were reported to be not easily accessible at all, and in some cases not accessible to services. So some of the key 
concepts in relation to, to providing a service, again, relate to multidisciplinarity or interdisciplinarity, tailoring services, uh, tailoring resources, tailoring staffing to the person's needs and desires, responsivity and individualization. So there's a lot of repeating themes here coming up, but that's challenged by inflexibility of resources. Uh, the effect of increasing complexity on others in the setting, which sometimes me means that the, that um, when when somebody's needs and their the, the equipment they have uh, may impact on other people, or some of the the the, the complexity impacts on other people, then the, the, that's a challenge maintaining somebody uh, to to age in place and the structural issues I've I've referred to as well. Uh, some other challenges are we need to think more about retirement end of life planning and bereavement um, um, as support, both for people with intellectual disability, but also for family members, uh, especially if, if, if a, a sibling, uh, somebody has a sibling in service and a parent dies, um, they, 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 the family member is dealing with the grieving of the loss of a parent, but is also often supporting the, 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 the grieving of the person with intellectual disability. Uh, just a, a quote, which I, 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 I thought it would be, Give, give you an idea of um, um, uh, the, I suppose, complexity and the challenges. Uh, the staff member said we would have a number of individuals living in smaller community houses that are aging, showing signs of dementia, and one or two would have got a diagnosis of dementia. So, trying to find a space where we're not continuous, where we're continuously bringing in, in different equipment, or trying to teach the people that they live with that uh, that, that things are changing. And so there's an impact on other people as well. And, and that there's a challenge there for, for, for meeting, meeting the person's needs in, in, in place. In terms of responding to individual needs, it was felt crucial that we listen to the voices of older people and those around them. And we're responding just not just to needs, but also to personal wishes. And that goes back to the concept of living the life of your choosing. It's, it's, it's not just based around your needs. Uh, some of the Things which contextualize that are environment. Again, I've, I've, I've talked about that in terms of structural issues and the ability to modify it. Standards and regulations and the interplay between HICWA standards and the policy that is, that, that's coming through, for example, HSC around the congregation, they can sometimes uh, uh, come uh, into conflict with each other and it becomes very difficult to, to, to achieve healthy aging in place and also to achieve person-centered supports. And again, they're challenged by the availability of funding and the ability of, fun of funding to be put in place uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the manner where it's responding to the person's need in a timely manner, I suppose. Challenges, funding is quite defined. I, I would call it congregated uh, and often not responsive to the individual's needs and, and wishes. Uh, staffing and assistive resources mightn't be readily available. Quality service may be unachievable, and person-centeredness might be, might be possible in the absence of the, of of of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a, a responsive funding model, and that results often in transitions to generic settings such as nursing homes. And I'm conscious that we don't have the voice of nursing homes in this study, due to the reasons I mentioned early on, but the those working in intellectual disability services often contextualize the move to nursing home as something where which, which they felt wasn't uh, the, the optimal outcome for people. So in this quote, the majority of our people have gone to nursing homes for, for, for the reason of not having the resources. It's not that we don't have the skills or we don't have the expertise or we don't have the experience. We're just finding it more and more difficult to get funding, any funding for anybody's changing needs. So we've a static funding model. Uh, so uh, services in terms of accessing mainstream health services often found workarounds and we, you know, they, they, this is often somebody knows somebody in a hospital or and it's a personal inter uh, relationship that, uh, and that they create ways of getting access to health services. The challenge there is that if those people move, there's no pathway left. And so they, they, there's a need for formal, formal pathways as opposed to workarounds. There was felt that there's a knowledge and skill deficit in mainstream services. And there's also, it was felt that there's a perception that intellectual disability services have their own professionals to meet health needs. So why should they need to go to generic health services? But I do 
and I want to give you an example next in the next slide. There were exemplars of clearly defined pathways in some services, particularly around palliative care and end of life care. And this is, is quite a, a poignant um, um, uh, quote. We had a huge meeting with the family, myself, the, the, the staff member, my manager and the GP and the whole package was put in place. And I have to say the end was just amazing. A staff team of 12 and one of her favorite staff and her other favorite staff got her, got her, uh, out, out, got her out of bed and came, uh, and came in. Uh, she said at half three that day, I'm going to sleep now. I'll miss you all. She died 12 hours later, but they were her last words. But there was, there was so much planning, so much had to go into. That planning was the integration of the, the specialist supports coming from outside the intellectual disability service and bringing them together with the supports that were in the service and also supporting the staff and the family and the person obviously themselves. So some final comments before I just summarize recommendations. We have an intellectual disability service approach in our country, which developed through the great work of voluntary organizations for many years, but it didn't develop according to any defined service model or defined uh, policy to guide the de development of service. I think that's a crucial thing. And while many services developed and did similar types of things, uh, the funding model which came wasn't linked to any policy driven approach. And so this it's clear that there's no real policy driven, um, um, policy driving service provision. And there's a need for us to, for, to examine that and develop a national model of service. When I say for healthy aging, it's for the lifespan of people with intellectual disabilities. We have an eclectic mix of approaches. Um, and many of these are driven by the limited availability of finance and resources. And so the, I've spoken to many people, both in this study and elsewhere, where people are doing great work and you have that dynamic and innovative groups of staff and dynamic and innovative services, but they keep hitting the wall of resource limitation, funding limitation, and they have to do, try and create responses which are not the optimal response in many situations for people with intellectual disability. So uh, I'll let you read the report rather than go through the, the fine uh, print here. We do recommend that there needs to be a national model of, ser of service for healthy aging amongst people with intellectual disabilities. And let's say, I won't go through that I, there are steps as to how that can be uh, achieved and they're in the report. We need to reconfigure intellectual disability services to meet age-related needs. We have, a we have national policies uh, on aging, but they're not playing out in intellectual disability service provision due to the absence of a policy approach and also uh, in, in, in terms of intellectual disability and also in the absence of, of a funding model which supports that. We need to de develop clear resource models that can respond in a timely manner, therefore, to the changing needs of older people with intellectual disabilities. And, and again, there, there are steps there and they're, they're continued on that slide. And finally, we need to build the knowledge and skills of professionals, formal and informal carers, and support family as well. And that, that's going to be challenging, I think, to uh, many of us working in, uh, in, in uh, those working in service, because we may, need to share skills. We need to look at, 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 is it the professionals that always need to be in position or is it the skills that need to be in position and configured? So we need to look at workforce design and what is best to meet the individual needs of people with intellectual disability. And in terms of my last slide, in terms of out, outcomes, two quotes of uh, the quality outcomes are, be, quality outcomes are being achieved, but uh, these are uh, and these are quotes from family members. He was very happy for those last two years of his life, even though he was in the wheelchair and basically nonverbal. He was just loved by the staff, and you could see that there were one or two. One particular man there, one of his carers, as soon as he walked into the room, his face would just light up. They had an amazing relationship. Another quote: His manager in the last house was amazing. Oh, they'd been together for twenty-six years. They were like a couple. They got on so well. So she made sure that everything was done for the right reasons. I suppose these are exemplars of what a quality aging in place, a 
a quality healthy aging service might look like in terms of, 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 of qualitative measurement. So I'm going to stop sharing at this point um, and uh, I'm going to hand it back uh, to, to Roz and then I, I, I think I'll be in, uh, uh, introducing the panel members thereafter uh, for, for a discussion of these findings. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Fintan. That was, uh, you managed to summarise quite a large report very well there, uh, very succinctly. So that was great. Um, and I think there'll be lots of discussion around it. So we've about 240 people uh, joined us on the webinar, uh, but we've only one question in so far. So get your questions in. And if you like someone's question, you'll be able to vote for it to move it up the line. But um, we have a few questions to get started. But first, Finton put together a, a great panel for us today. So I'm going to let Finton introduce the panel to you first. Okay, th th thanks for that. And so on, on, on the panel, we have uh, well, myself, I'm an Associate Professor with Intellectual Disability in Nursing at the School of Nursing and Midwifery in Trinity College and linked to Trinity Centre for Aging and Intellectual Disability. Um, Helena Connors is the Policy and Research Officer at the National Federation of Voluntary Bodies. Uh, Dr. Sandra Fleming is a um, assistant professor in intellectual disability nursing, working with me in the School of Nursing and Midwifery in Trinity College. Uh, Marianne Byrne is a family member whose son receives intellectual disability service, and we're delighted to, to, to have you here, uh, Marianne. Um, professor Mary McCarran is professor of aging and intellectual disability, uh, director of the Trinity Centre for Aging and Intellectual Disability and principal investigator of IDS Tilda. Uh, uh, professor Philip McCallion is Professor and Director at the Temple School of Social Work, Temple University, Philadelphia, uh, a long time uh, um, uh, ally to, to us in, in, in the Trinity Centre for Aging and Intellectual Disability and co-principal investigator of IDS Tilda. And Dr Maureen Deeth is a research fellow at the School of Nursing and Midwifery in Trinity College Dublin and was central to the work of this report. Great. Thanks very much, Fintan. So we've lots of expertise here. So maybe just to get started, um, it was very clear from your study to the, to the desire of the participants that people uh, should be able to age in place. And that's also something that's reflected uh, in the UNCRPD. So how feasible is that, though, in reality? And how, you know, how, how realistic is it in practice, maybe you know, not for everybody, but for some people or, you know, what, maybe some thoughts on that. So I don't know maybe who wants to start on that. Mary? Okay. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Fintan, for, for, for that great presentation and report. Yeah, well, I think, you know, aging in place is certainly where we should be coming from. It's what we all want. It's, it, it, it's what we all aspire to. But aging in place is a, a slippery concept in many ways. And does that mean that we're going to age in the home that I'm always in? Does it mean that I'm, and there may be different reasons that as I age that I might decide to move from A to B. But I don't think that we have really um, uh, thought that through in terms of intellectual disability services. So that, does that, does aging in place mean the person will stay in that group home forever? or that they will leave and move into another home within us, within the organization or within the service. Um, I think many people with intellectual disability, there's huge value for people to be able to age, to, to, to be with their friends, to be with their families and peers. And we should be aspiring to do that. And even if they're not able to continue there, we should move. But I think the biggest issue for services at the moment is when a home outstrips its capacity to give care with comfort or with safety, we have no defined thinking about where next for that individual. Are we going to keep them to be supported within the ID service system? Or are they going to go to general nursing homes? And that's the big issue I think that we need to decide and we need to try to sort out. Thanks, Mary. Uh, Mary Ann, could I bring you in there? Would you have any thoughts on, on that about the aging in place? Maybe just unmute yourself there before. Um, hi. Um, so long as I'm able to look after my son in my home, that would make me very happy. That's all I want for him. I don't want him to go to nursing homes or I don't want him to go anywhere else 
but to stay in his own environment where he's always been and where he's happiest. So that's my take on it. I, I just want him with me until I, hopefully I'm able to look after him until the end. He has dementia and we hope I'm well enough and his daddy's well enough to look after him in his own home. Great. Yeah, no, and we, we hope that for you as well. Thank you. And I see a question here in from Deirdre and she says, as a sibling and a community nurse, this is so interesting, also true. There needs to be a policy funding and planning for the thousands of adults with ID living at home with elderly parents. And I think that's a point you made very clearly, Fintan. And I know from the previous work the centre has done around this issue of planning, but nothing seems to have happened really at a policy level with regard to that. So what, what could happen there, do you think, or is it all part of this national service model? Who, who maybe wants to talk about that? Uh, Maureen, would I bring you in there? Just put yourself off mute, Maureen. Just to go back to what Mary was saying and, and to what um, Marie Anne's saying, that that lack of certainty, I think, um, has a huge impact on, on families. There's a complete sort of precarity around what's going to happen in the future. And ageing, I think, it's just become another cliff edge that families and individuals with disability are facing, you know, the same as schooling and school leaving and entering adult services. Um, and now we have this, this precarity around ageing. And um, with the families that I spoke to, um, the prospect of a nursing home was a source of huge anxiety. The, the family members want the, the family members wanted their brother, sister, child to stay within the services in some in, in some manner. And even it, it, I think of um, one sibling that I spoke to and her sister went into residential services age four and she's now in her 60s but this sister still had no security she had a lot of anxiety about um, the sister becoming too unwell to stay within the services and what will happen and that's despite having a, a whole lifetime within services um, family members don't have any sense of security about what may happen um, in the future. Um, I think that's a huge issue. <clears throat> Thanks, Maureen, for that. Um, Helena, do you want to come in on, on any of that from, from your perspective? Because you would support a lot of different groups who probably encounter a lot of these issues. Absolutely, Rosalind, and thank you for bringing me in. Uh, I'd just like to say, first of all, um, you know, we really welcome this really important research uh, and it's it's fantastic to have it. It really kind of builds on what we've been hearing from services, you know, over the years. And it's great to have that, uh, have it evidenced. And I think, uh, as Maureen was saying, you know, not being able to plan ahead and not being able to proactively um, plan for the future and to have some, you know, like um, Marianne was saying, like her plan and her hope is that her son will stay at home. But, you know, it's great to also be able to make alternative plans if they're needed. Hopefully they never will be, but people need to be able to know what are the alternatives if, if they're needed. So I think um, that is such a huge block. And by not having the, the policy in place and not having the, the, the funding mechanisms in place, you know, then it's, it's impossible for people to be proactive in how they plan. And it's very difficult then to start those conversations with families if there's nothing definitive, you know, that you can offer as a service to them. So it does, it's a real, it's a real kind of, you know, um, blocking point in terms of, of people being able to kind of look at their, their options down the line. And I suppose just in terms of the question, Rosalind, you know, um, the HSE's last corporate plan, they have committed like that they are, they want to reimagine and reform the disability sector. So I think, you know, this really would feed into that. Like, like Fintan has said from the research, it really shows that we don't have like a, a one model or a good model or several good models for um for set for the sector to follow. So I think you know this is this would be really timely now for us to look at that and try and get something so that we can share the best practice that's out there. And I'm sure this would have come across in the research as well, but we know from our own services that when, where there is good practice, services and staff really want to share that. They want to be able to, you know, for other people to also know how to provide, you know, good services. So, um, yeah, I think that would be really helpful. 
Great. Uh, thanks, Selena. And there is a, a question has just come in, but I'll, I'll go to it rather than one of the earlier ones, just because it's, it's relevant to this point. But it's around that, you know, that if a national service model was introduced, um, the coordination efforts that would be required to get such a mo model adopted because of our diverse mix of public and voluntary service providers, what, what challenges do you think that would create in trying to implement a model sort of across quite a diverse range of different service providers. Fintan, maybe that's one you might want to take. I, I, I think when none of us imagine that uh, this would be easy, none of us imagine that this is something that will, 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 could be rolled out in a very short period of time. Um, we have to all consider that uh, I remember when we started the work of decongregation in in, uh, in the past. We we uh, if something's driven by policy but not driven by the person's desires and needs, it can be a very traumatic experience for the for for, for the people with intellectual disability. So we, I think we have to be sensitive to that. I think some of the 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 the, the challenges now. Helena's referred to the 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 need the recognition of a need for a rethink. Uh, at, at high levels. I think we need to uh, ensure that that, that person-centeredness, that the, the person-centered support, individualized funding is something which is imagined and realized at the highest echelons of service provision in terms of the decision makers at government, uh, those at the, at, at, uh, in, at, at, at the highest levels in the HSC, and that that's what filters down. Uh, and that may allow us then to re realize policy change. And I don't know that it has to be so directive that only uh, only one model is possible. Because if, if you create something that's just one model, then we're just we're going to constrain the possibilities of people achieving the model which is relevant to their needs and wishes. So it all goes back to that that in uh, in that focus on the individual. We've again like we've we've seen the challenges in rolling out personalized budgets. Um, and and it's, it's been so slow and I'm, I'm not sure what's, what's stymieing that uh, at this point, but it suggests to me that there, that it isn't just, we don't have a shared understanding or a shared belief in concepts such as individualization at all levels of decision-making. Um, and that's what I think needs to be embedded within policy. What comes out the, the, the end of that, in terms of that model, is a structure which allows funding to follow the person. And as Mary said, that may involve in, uh, people living at home for, uh, in their home for as long as is feasible and possible. But we all know, and I've told my children that I, I want to live at home and I want to die at, in my home, but that mightn't be achievable. I don't know what complexity will happen in my life, the same way with any, anyone else, including people with intellectual disability. In some cases, that funding needs to support them getting, preferably, I think, if we were doing looking at this from an idealistic utopian point of view, preferably in mainstream community supports. But that suggests that the knowledge, skills, and and understandings that that are embedded within intellectual disability services would be available to people with intellectual disability in those generic mainstream areas. And it's clear at the moment that, 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 that there's a, de uh, a deficiency in that regard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's very true. And Philip, maybe if I can come to you, what learning, Philip is based in the US, but is you know, very familiar with both the Irish and the US uh, systems. What learning maybe is there for us from, from the US? Well, you know, I always say that when you ask me about the U.S., I always ask, well, what, what part of the U.S.? Yeah. Because clearly there's a lot of different responses going on. But I, but I do think that this is an issue that uh, many in the U.S. are struggling with as well. Um, there's, you know, this desire to not lose what we have achieved within our intellectual disability service systems. I think, too, there's a desire to recognize that things have changed. That um, that families are are much more significant. Not that they weren't always significant, but we're having a better appreciation of that significance. And you know, I was very struck, uh, Marianne, when when you spoke that sort of like let's not just talk about policies and let's not just talk about 
uh, things that we're going to build. But let's also talk about how do we maintain love in our systems? Uh, and and you it's just it was such a an important message that you gave to all of us about the choices uh, that families get to make, that people with intellectual disabilities get to make, and that should be driving what we're all doing. I think uh, my experience in Ireland is that I think that your system is is changing very rapidly, uh, largely because of the difficulties of, you know, and actually happening here too, that as costs go up, the thought of sort of constructing more group homes or more uh, alternative living arrangements, it becomes daunting. And so, but yet at the same time, we can't just say to families, okay, uh, sorry, we can't build another group home. It should be thinking about what are the services that are needed. But we've always talked about that we wanted people with intellectual disabilities in all of our countries to live lives in the community. You get to live lives in the community when you build supports, when there is the education, that where the, the services that serve the general population are equipped, but also are told that they must serve this population to in an equal basis. But I think, you know, the last thing I'll say is that's probably the oldest person on this panel, um, that, um, you know, I'm thinking about these issues for myself as well. And I know that, um, that there will be a number of different choices. So I also want to think about that even if I'm going to move, how do I make sure that the things that I value are still going to be part of my life? That aging in place is not just about a physical place. It's also about all the things that are meaningful to me. And I think that we have to be much more thoughtful, and we're being very thoughtful, but much more thoughtful uh, about how do we provide those kinds of supports as well. And, and finally, I just say, I've always really appreciated uh, the NDA for the commitment that they've had to these kinds of ideas and for sort of pushing all of us to think differently, to think about sort of how, how we really in, improve and support quality in all of our lives, but in particular, those with disabilities. Great. Well, thanks, Philip. Some some really interesting points you've, you've made there. Yeah, lots of food for thought in there. Uh, there's a question here. It's got a good few votes. Um, and um, it's about the sort of difference between the, the medical model and the social model and how in a way you're sort of, there's a transition to the more social model at the moment, not fully, but it, it's there. But now we're sort of talking about with the complex uh, aging and then the health needs, are we moving back to sort of a medical model and how do you get that balance right? Uh, Sandra, is that something you'd like to, to take? Um, uh, thanks, uh, Roslyn. I think that what came from the participants, this, this was a struggle and, and a challenge um, across all services. Uh, we, where we seen that even in uh, those services where it was predominantly um, social care led, that they were finding that in order to be able to support uh, the, the people that lived and who availed of their services, that sometimes they felt that there was a deficit when they couldn't, uh, they didn't have the expertise or the skill mix to provide maybe the nursing care uh, to maybe, um, uh, I suppose, to, to um, support the person maybe with, with health related um, conditions. Um, and I think that what people sort of seen was that, you know, how, how do we merge both of them? That you can't, it, you know, it doesn't always work that you just purely have a medical or a nursing um, uh, model or that you, you have social care. It's looking at, again, going back to, and this is what the participants talked about, the needs of the individual. Um, and they were very much, I think, talking about what, what Mary and, and Philip spoke about is what does actually aging in place actually mean? It's not about a physical environment, but it's about how do we support the person um, a, a, a across. And I think that what came out of it was that, like, say, in over 70% of the participants of the study, they recognized that there wasn't actually the proper skill mix uh, within uh, the, the services. So I think that rather than talking about maybe, you know, going a, a medical or social care model, we need to look at maybe what is the skill mix um, that the person requires, not the service, but the, the actual uh, person. 
Um, and, and that was something that, that um, came out quite, quite a bit from, from the, the participants. Um, and they, they identified, you know, areas where maybe that they weren't able to provide uh, the, the, the skill set for the particular persons that lived in, in, in that area or who, who or sorry, who lived in that home or availed the service. And as a result of that, the person had to, to move somewhere else to an area that the staff didn't want them to go to. And that was quite a cause of anxiety and distress for some of our particip the participants of the study who actually, you know, talked about having to maybe somebody go to a generic nursing home because the skill set and the skill mix wasn't within the service that they were um, so I, I, I don't think it's, it's one against the other. I think it's how do we have a, a workforce that can actually uh, um, address the, the specific needs of the person and their wishes and the wishes of, of, of their families yeah. as well. Uh, yeah, that, that's really interesting, Sandra, but it, just a related point, and, and uh, Fintan touched on this earlier, but it, in terms of that, uh, maybe some of the, the mainstream health services feel that the ID services, you know, they have the professionals in place. Why do you need us? We're already overworked. So how do you get that balance between building up the skills, say, internally within the ID service and then convincing, you know, the mainstream health services yeah. that you do need that support and you can't have everything, if you like, in-house? How, how can that be done? Yeah, um, I think that really, you know, the, the, there was uh, um, one service that they, they talked about the way that they actually worked in collaboration uh, with multidisciplinary teams from generic services. But it was very much like what Benton was saying is it's who you know. Um, I suppose, and there, there was, you know, people talked about that there was this, you know, automatic thing that if you were in an ID service, uh, that you actually didn't need uh, input from generic services, particularly in relation to maybe specific palliative care support um, or, or public health health uh, uh, nurse. Um, and so that, that they felt that that's where maybe sometimes, you know, one service uh, spoke about that where maybe somebody who had been in maybe an acute uh, hospital couldn't actually be discharged uh, because the, the generic service wasn't willing to put the to, to liaise and to work with the, the ID service to try to bridge um, that, that gap to allow the person to be supported uh, back in, in, in their own home. So I think that the conversation needs to be looked at in terms of how do we work with the generic services in, in terms of having more uh, collaboration um, in, in terms of, of, of availing. Where people, where it worked, it worked out very well. But as Fintan said, it was more so in terms of who, who we networked with and, and who people knew. And so we can't always rely on that because if that breaks down, the pathway is, is, is gone. Um, yeah. And like we are, you know, seeing that more and more of, of the our ideas are working in primary care. Um, it was one of the findings from the Shape in the Future of, of uh, Intellectual Disability in Nursing in, in Ireland. And, and we do see that in, in our programmes of, of um, undergraduate that we are introducing the theoretical and the clinical components, at, uh, you know, such as maybe having uh, full health assessments and that with, with our students. But I think that we have to acknowledge that primary care just isn't, isn't always about a health focus. It's also about, you know, the social and, and psychological and, and, and that. So um, I, I don't have the, the answer in terms of, of how we, we can do it. But I, I do know that in the areas where there was a, a, a services had good linkage with generic and um, multidisciplinary teams, that they felt that they were actually able to deliver um, high quality care and support to the person. Can I come in there, um, Rose, yeah. if you don't mind, very briefly? Um, uh, the, the, the question initially was around the social model and, 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 and medical model, and I think we, we need to move away from the question being about the model uh, and being instead being, as Sandra said, being about the person. Um, if, if, if any of us become ill, we engage with health services in relation to that component of our life at that time. And that's what I think is being, is being, is being uh, suggested here. The, we're seeing an emerging complexity, health-related complexity, which we weren't seeing to the same degree in the past. And it's, it's, it's largely because the demographic in terms of aging uh, has, has, has changed amongst the intellectual disability population. 
so as health issues emerge, we need to be able to respond to those health issues. And I don't think that's moving to a medical model. It's it's mm. it's it's provide, it, ensuring that the right health supports are there. The last thing, how do we? Uh, your 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 other question there. We're starting to see on foot of the report which Sandra referred to and Mary Mary led uh, at the Shaping the Future of Intellectual Disability in Nursing in 2018. We're starting to see liaison roles uh, happening, uh, becoming reality in, in, in general hospitals, such that there are RNIDs working there who can help to, 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 to uh, streamline and to manage the pathway of the person with intellectual disability to the general hospital. They're only new and it will take time for them to really become embedded. But those types of things are, are starting to happen. So I, again, I think that there, there are possibilities there for, for creating real pathways as opposed to the informal ones which were raised identified in the report. Yeah, thanks, Fintan, that's, can that's I great. Can I say something, sorry, can I can come in on yes. the, palliative, Marianne, yes. the palliative side of nursing. We had experience with it with our girl, she passed away but for the last two weeks of her life palliative would only come from monday to friday now we had to deal with saturday and sunday and um, we i thought like why is it not there on saturday sunday mm -hmm. you know yeah. because she well i'm not saying lucky enough she they were there for her when she did go, but had she died on Saturday or Sunday, there was no support. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't, yeah, no, I can take your point there. That's, that's, yeah, you don't die to a timetable, not no. right. Yeah, absolutely. No. Um, Mary, I see you want to come in there and I, I, I you're probably following on from Finton's point, but I might get you to address as well. There's a question here that asks about the use of the HSE comprehensive geriatric assessment as a tool that could be, you know, adapted maybe to suit people with disabilities. So it's that link between mainstream services and specialist ID services and, and how they work together. Yeah, well, I, I think I think, you know, that is really important. And I think we must work together. There is huge expertise within mainstream geriatric services that that uh, we, we need to ensure that people with ID can access. And I think a good example of that is how we have managed to build a national intellectual disability memory clinic, which is really coming under mainstream aging. And where, where, where it, we're using, we're working together jointly between ID, bringing the experts from ID to work in this memory clinic and supporting a, a service to be delivered using the expertise as well of generic memory clinic. So that is a model that we have done. It's very successful and it is useful. And I certainly think that we need the expertise of mainstream geriatricians. We need it. it we we they need support. Uh, and many of them would say to me, you know, Mary, until uh, without having the support from the RNIDs and the ID services, this would be very challenging for us to deliver this memory service. So it has worked for those reasons. But I think one of the fundamental issues is we have no idea on how to cost services. And we have a huge piece of work to do in terms of understanding how to cost, how to cost disability services, what that model would look like. I mean, one of the biggest challenges that's driving many of these issues is if you used to bring in an extra staff member on night duty or two extra staff if somebody needs support with, with care. This is just driving costs very often unsustainable, and there is no funding within the current model to support this change in need. So I think that, that is a piece of work. I know that Helena and, 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 and the National Federation and ourselves and the HSE are now beginning to work on and, and with the NDA is trying to see can we can we can we look at how how to cost some of these because that's going to be a big driver. Is it realistic for us to put you know two staff on night duty or three staff on night duty in four or five community group homes like i'm i don't know if it is or not or can we support that or can the service can the public purse support that and we've got to really see how that is but look take it to Anne marie's point like rather than Anne marie's son having to come into a service the service should be going out and giving support to Anne marie's uh, family member as Anne-Marie and the family member and, and, and they wish 
rather than feeling the model is, is, is to build another service or to build another thing. How do we build that outreach? How do we build really, really good respite? And how do we cost all of that in a new model and, and, and working across services a bit like we have done with perhaps the National Ideal Memory Clinic? Yeah, no, the great points, uh, Mary. And Helena, maybe because that's the costing issue is, I'm sure, an issue that you, the members of the Federation of Voluntary Bodies, you know, deal with every day. And how, how do you crack that one? And, you know, it's a little bit like firefighting a lot of the time, isn't it? Well, it is. But as Mary says, at the moment, like we don't know what the costs are, like the cost of changing need and the complex needs as people age. It wasn't included in the disability capacity review. So it is a piece of work that needs to be done now. And we are really happy to be working with the Trinity Centre for, for Aging and Intellectual Disability and the HSC and yourselves to try and um, get some answers and to try and, you know, get some idea of what, what the costs are and so that proper funding mechanisms can be put in place. You know, it's it's so important um, that, that that is done. Like, uh, and just in, in relation to the models, I just think as well, if we were to look at it from kind of a human rights approach and, you know, and bring in the UNCRPD and, and work to that as well, it might bring us past, you know, the worrying about the type of model that, um, you know, that the service is running. So uh, likewise, in terms of a model for um, for people aging, I do think, like Fintan said already, it needs to be incredibly flexible and person centred. So why we need some overarching policy, we really need to have flexibility and adaptability within that in order to be able to support families, you know, and, and for people who want to age in place, like it's so important. Yeah, no, thanks, Lena. And there's a question here asking, is there anything happening at HSC or government level to develop a national policy or standards and do HICWA have a role? Well, it, just to say that Fintan has agreed to present to a smaller group of the HSC and the Department of Health, and I think HICWA are going to join as well, uh, just to, to have a little bit more of an in-depth conversation about how this can be brought forward. So we'll, there will be, you know, watch this space, as we say. So um, there's a few questions in about relating to staff and staff shortages. And as you become more person centred and, you know, you want people to live more independently, there's a lot of need for more staff. And how can that, um, how can the staffing challenges be addressed? Uh, who wants, Maureen, would you talk about that? The staffing challenges arose um, a lot um, during the interviews and, and focus groups, um, and it was around um, the the lack of RNIDs. Um, people talked about running recruitment campaigns and not getting any any applicants at all, or just getting new recruits who just stayed for a year. There was a big disparity as well between um, the services, the extent to which they had to use agency staff. And whereas some services, you know, it was, it was some people that we spoke to, it was a huge source of pride that they didn't use agency staff. Um, others were quite dependent on them. And there was lots of issues then around them not knowing um, the individuals. Um, it's also around the use, it, 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 I'm going off the point now here slightly, as I do, um, just in terms of, of, of um, the inflexibility of, of resources. And it brings to mind um, one example, what, no, more than one example. There were several examples of people who were moved into nursing homes. And again, this was the family's hugest fear. The nursing homes really weren't able to support the individual. And so the services ended up supporting the individual within the nursing home, sometimes on a 24 hour to 24 hour extent or with a family member being in at night and um, and a staff from the services being in during the day. And that seemed to be one a huge waste of resources, but also an indication of the inflexibility of of the resources and that inflexibility and the rigidity of the funding just came up again and again and that people's needs um, may change very dramatically and very quickly but to um but the funding model meant that uh everything was really really slow so the process of putting in business cases which were perceived to just disappear into some black hole somewhere and then if they did come back they came back um, so the whole structure around funding, around staffing, 
um, and around the structure um, just seems so fundamentally flawed um, to the detriment of the individuals and their families. Yeah, thanks, Maureen. And you've touched on a few of the questions that came in there. There was one asking, did the study look at nursing homes? And I think you may have missed Finton saying that while it was intended to do that, uh, look at mainstream nursing homes, just with COVID, it just wasn't possible to engage, engage with them for this study. But there's, you know, raising some of the similar issues that you did there, Maureen, about, you know, a lot of funding going to nursing home places, but no funding for supports or very few funding for supports for people within their own homes. Um, Philip, you want to come back in there? Yeah, you know, I, and I think about this a lot, both in the US context and, and in the Irish context, that I, I think that the reality is that for many of us, nursing home will be part of our experience of aging. Not all of us, hopefully we'll all get to, to, to live and uh, the, out our lives uh, where, where, where we've always wanted to be but it is something that comes up. And I think we have two choices here. We can see this in a conflictual way that sort of nursing homes are something we don't want and are, uh, and are, are we can look at, so how do we influence them just as we're seeking to influence other generic services? But I think more than anything else, you know, that, you know, one of the, one of the criticisms historically of intellectual disability services is what, as a friend of mine used to say, was that we all have an edifice complex, that if there's a problem, we build a building for it or we build a program. And how do we look at problems and how do we utilize resources in new and creative ways that don't necessarily require buildings, models, programs, but just help people to live the lives they want to live in the place they want to live it doing the things that they want to do. And, and many times that's not about more staff necessarily. It's about sort of more creative ways of utilizing resources. It's really the basis for individualized budgets, participant directed services, the belief that perhaps families and the person with an intellectual disabilities themselves do know sort of what it is that they need. And there are new and creative ways in which we can do that so that as we look at dealing with what is a very critical problem as populations age, how will we support them not to go in the directions or completely in the directions that, that we've always gone in and not to say that, uh, and I realize this is controversial, but not to necessarily say that some, left, some types of services are absolutely not the case. We want people to live in the community. We want them to receive services on the same basis as everyone else. And for many of us, nursing home will be part of that service network. How do we make sure if that is part of the service network that it genuinely meets the needs of people with intellectual disabilities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an important question. Um, and highlighted by this study as, as as being a gap so yeah important to see how that can be be addressed sandra uh, thanks it's just to follow on on uh, what uh, philip was saying there um, what we, uh, some of the participants in, in, in the study actually spoke about um, how COVID had impacted um, on the, um, the service and the way services were de delivered, and also to, in terms of the person, uh, how, how their choice and their, I suppose, their wishes became uh, more apparent uh, during COVID. Um, and it made them sort of think about how to maybe look at how maybe rigid. Um, um, sort of rostering was actually detrimental to, to the in, individual. So, for example, when the uh, COVID pandemic started and day services were, were, were not available, um, the challenge was how do we look at, you know, supporting a person in a community home where traditionally everybody went was gone by maybe nine o'clock or 10 o'clock in the morning and didn't return to their home uh, in, in the afternoon. Um, and staff were saying is how enjoyable it was really to be able to engage with the person and find out what is it that you really want. So if the person, you know, we talk about, you know, the concept of retirement for the person who is uh, who has uh, an intellectual disability, and yet we're still sometimes expecting somebody 65 and plus to be going to day services. So, you know, what, so the choice of the individual was that if they wanted to have a lie-in, they could have a lie-in, and that COVID actually, and the restrictions around lockdown, 
actually made staff an awful lot more aware of that and looked at the whole issue about being very, uh, how, how do, did they build in flexibility? And there tended to be sort of nursing staff in one area and maybe social care staff in another. And they were looking at how do we bridge that and how do, do they, they work together? And then the other challenge that they talked about was that, you know, when uh, COVID restrictions lifted and day services then opened, the other challenge was then how do you then, do you say to the person, you can't have your lie in now anymore, you have to start getting back up um, at, at, you know, eight o'clock to be ready to go on, on the bus. So they were talking about the whole issue, as Fintan had spoke about earlier on, about, you know, that it should be, this, the workforce should, should follow the, the, the person not the other way around, um, and that the, the rights of and the wishes of the, the person with an intellectual disability and their families, but also to the wishes that the staff have. A lot of the staff, you know, felt compromised uh, when they had to follow maybe rigid routines that had been set up, um, you know, in, in, uh, in, in services long ago that, that weren't catering for people as they aged and with complex needs. So they really talked about how to build in a flexible um, workforce. And again, the issue of costing came up. They, they did acknowledge there was no costing um, model there to actually support it. So they were relying an awful lot on the goodwill of the staff. Um, right. And yeah. staff were inclined to, to give that goodwill because they, they seen the benefit that it was for, for, for the individual. Right, great. And Mary Ann, can I just bring you in there again? Just you touched earlier on that issue around flexibility when you were talking about the palliative care. Are there other thoughts you have in relation to maybe flexibility or, or any of the other issues we've touched on? Well, staff and I suppose would be um, an issue where Robert comes from, where he is, is, is going to daycare. I don't think there's enough male staff for the male clients. I hate that word client, <laughs> but there's not enough male staff for them because if the client has issues that are male related, they won't go to the females. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we've experienced it now with where he goes to daycare. There is one staff who is male and he's brilliant with them. Brilliant. So maybe you can get more male staff. Yeah, I know that because it is quite a female dominated uh, profession in, in general. Yes, that, that's a very interesting point. Uh, Mary, we're, we're going to have to finish up soon. So Mary, we'll give you yeah, maybe the yeah, second. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, just to say that it's been a great conversation. I suppose my biggest concern will be that the people who may where at the worst in all of this are those with a kind of a mild or moderate intellectual disability who moved out into community group homes with little or no resources. And people who have moved out in decongregated sense, and we need to continue with decongregation with severe or more, uh, more intense needs, moved with the staffing and the group homes and the structures was okay for them. So the group that I'm most concerned about are, 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 are those, that particular group. And I think COVID shone a light in many ways on probably the unsuitability of nursing homes in some ways for, 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 for us all in terms of the environment and the infrastructure. So I think as a society, we should be looking at a different model because the nursing home resembles to me a bigger model than most of the congregated settings I've ever worked with in, in terms of size and structure, et cetera. So we do need to be much more creative as a, at a societal level, both for people with ID, and I think the ID services have good experience in how to deliver good care in smaller settings. And we should also be informing the model of care suitable for the generic elderly. So, so because we have, we have a lot of experience in that. But that is the group, I think, that are most at risk. And they're most at risk of being, because we're developing complexity, not in the 80s or 90s, but maybe in the 40s or 50s. And, and none of us want to be in a nursing home in the 40s or 50s. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Uh, before I finish up, Fintan, do you want to say anything? Finally? Yeah, yes, if you don't mind. And uh, and uh, I just one thing one thing to say in relation to the report, going back to the the key recommendation 
about a, a national model of service for healthy uh, for, for healthy aging across the lifespan of people with intellectual disabilities. Some of the questions that have been been raised by 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 people in, uh, attending this uh, webinar have have been around staffing, and a lot of the comments have been around staffing. And it may be that we need to reimagine. Uh, in an individualized budget uh, context, if that is realized, what staffing can, will look like. It may be very different. And that may answer some of Mary's queries as well around our comments around uh, uh, how we fund that. Um, it, it may not be the staffing models that we have at the moment, it may not be the people, the, the, the groups who are there. But this, if, this, if this is about people with intellectual disability, that must be the driving. Uh, uh, factor here. I want to finish uh, by saying thank you, uh, if you uh, allow me, uh, Russ. Uh, thank you to everybody who took part in this study, um, the, the the services, the the, the, the staff, um, the family members, and the people with intellectual disability. But I also want to say thank you to those who uh, worked with me on the team. And finally, I know this stretch over a period of two years instead of the intended one year. Uh, the patience and the support of the NGA was 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 so so welcome and so valued, and I want to thank you, Ros, and thank you, your, your colleague David, as well, for the support that you gave us during this. Yeah, you know, you're very welcome, and we're del delighted to see it published. And it was worth the wait because we would have, you know, if we stuck to the one year timeline, we would have had a much inferior product. So, so it was great. Um, and thank so you, th thank you. To, sorry, just thank you also to Marianne for for. Uh, I know you've 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 travelled from your home to Trinity Centre for Aging and Intellectual Disabilities to take part today, and I really appreciate that. And your 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 perspectives have been really important here today. Thank you, and thanks, Helena, as well for the perspectives of the National Federation. Yeah, so it just leaves me to say thanks again to, to all of our panellists. Uh, really appreciate your input. Thank you also to um, Catherine and Vanessa, who are our sign language interpreters, and Michelle is our captioner. So I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and go off and have your lunch. Philip, you're probably just having your breakfast at this point, but um, thank you very much. And we'll send you out the link uh, both to the study and to the, the webinar when we, we, uh, when we finish. But you, you'll be able to find the study on our website and on the Trinity website as well. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Mm -hmm.